All right, let's pray. Oh God, as we, uh, as we gather in your name, what we pray, Lord, is that you would guide us in our discussion uh, today in our time of uh, reflected study. Uh, so we open our minds and our hearts to this, uh, and we do this in the name of Christ. Amen. One o'clock. Um, but it's books that have to do with the life of saints. Dead serious on this. And there, there are, I've got a few. Uh, or even the martyrs. There's a couple of Fox Book of Martyrs. Is, is probably a big one. That's almost like a textbook type. And what they do, I mean, they've just collected the stories of martyrs. Well, I mean, you know, now martyrs by nature, what had to happen? They had to die, right, and they had to die for their faith. And, and most, most martyrs don't die sitting on the front porch at 102 drinking coffee, all right? So, I mean, you know, they're, you know, they might have been grinded up into the grounds that made the coffee. I mean, that's probably what it would be for, for a martyr. Um, but what you'll discover is that they approach all this differently. And, and, there, and there's, that's what I want you to hear, and if you're interested in study this. And, and, and even when you read their writings, uh, they write about this future divine glory. And so even faced with temptation or faced with recanting, they will not. And the reason why not is because there, there, is, this, there, there is this sense of assurance that uh, from trust in God that although this might be a momentary affliction, there is something worth it after this and uh, so I mean it's really I mean one of the one of the reasons why I love I mean I've been a church you know when I say a church historian don't don't you know I like to read that it doesn't mean I'm a really a historian probably more so than the average minister uh, but one of the th reasons why I sort of geek towards that is because of this people who are are everyday people these are not people that are you know we, we have a tendency to see saints or a tendency to see people in the Bible as if they are superhuman and we're over here in class you know in, in you know in uh, you know their first class and we're over here at the back of the plane you know just economy class or something now they're they're everyday people okay and the same work of Christ or the same work of the Spirit that Paul is describing in Romans chapter 8 what what works in their life, I mean, it's not like Christ does something special in them and, and you only get, you know, the leftovers. No, it's the same God, the same Christ and the same Spirit. Um, and, and, but what, what you see in their life is they're, they're settled. And, they're, uh, and it's not that they're free for, their life is free from pain. I mean, most of the saints' life, man, they're horrible, terrible. I mean, not just because it ended the way it ended, but I mean, they, they, they're, they, they, they're, they're born out of these, these, of life in general, and life by nature is not always good, and and yet, uh, God, sort of guides them through, and uh, but one of the one of the characteristics that shows up in, in all their lives that I think is just fantastic, and worth recapturing, which means worth reflecting on which means worth praying more with it and about it and, and, and just allowing it to direct your thoughts, is this understanding of the not yet component of your faith. Oh yeah, same thing, right? So I mean, uh, all, all that, I mean, and, uh, but it's the idea of, well, and even some, so from those, those old spirituals, the imagery that comes out of, and a lot of it is Old Testament, um, you know, crossing the Jordan or passing through and things of that nature. And, and those are good images. And, and the, Jacob's right, exactly right. Same thing. So, um, and, and Jacob's ladder by nature is what? We're going to look at this on Sunday, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's wrestling and struggling with God. The ladder is not, he sees it, goes to it, and he ends up wrestling. So, I mean, it, you know, uh, uh, most of us don't consider wrestling as a peaceful uh, entity. Um, 
but there is this this uh, not yet component that I you know if you don't get anything else from this morning, you know I hope that this just implants itself not in the you know the deep part of your subconscious that you you know forget about, but it just that just inside of the the conscious part of of your mind, and it, I hope that it just replays itself little by little, um, and because it's worth owning that part of our faith. I mean, our, our society, more so than other societies, this is one of my, another one of my theories, okay, is that we, we are so pain-averse. Pain-averse. We, we cannot, yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, um, you know, um, and some of that is, is through uh, technological advancements like in medicine and, and what we know about science and social science and things of that nature. And they're good, okay? I'm not, you know, listen, I like that. I mean, uh, but one of the side effects is that any aspect of pain, physically, emotionally, relationally, we shudder. And we want to, you know, we want to drive, go through the drive-through, get our, you know, our pain-free aspect, and go on about our day. And um, and that's that's a little different than previous societies and generations. And uh, because what shows up, and we're going to get to this here in a second, is what's a part of creation that might not be by original design, but it is a part of creation is some aspect of suffering. All right? I mean, that's what we read just a while ago. I, I think, and, and you read, right? I mean, t- talked about the idea of groaning and, you know, not just on an individual, but, a, but a, you know, I mean, a, on a cosmic level. Um, you know, suffering with Paul, and this, just stay with this for a second, can be, okay? Now, here can be. Can be a cause of celebration. Why? Don't look at the board. <laughs> Good, that's right. Uh, um, b- because it it produces uh, it 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 can. Now listen, it can be. All right. I'm not saying that uh, suffering can be an experience that produces something greater than by going through it as as and it's it's to me it's one of the wonderful things about God it you know from lemons can come lemonade all right so uh, and so because of that then there's there's levels of maybe even appreciation uh, celebration might be too strong a word um, because it produces what we call virtue or it can be at least um, most people uh, human nature and this is not my theory this is you can just from biology, uh, social sciences, whatever. Um, most people like homeostasis. You know what that is? Want to stay, stay, in, stay in the condition that I'm in right now. And, and human beings are by far the ones who love homeostasis more than any other aspect inside of, of the cosmos. Um, and uh, so to venture out of homeostasis um, requires more energy than what it takes to stay in homeostasis, right? Okay, you with me? So pain uh, is something that forces the in- forces the person or or the you know the entity or whatever to move out of homeostasis. All right. So that's why we don't like pain is because it forces us to move, which means then that human beings by nature have a tendency, and I'm going to use now my language, to not seek maturity, whether you're in life or maturation of faith, uh, whether you talk about it in a, on a spiritual context or not, um, or growth or however you want to describe it. I, that's okay with me. But we don't seek that when there's no influx of an outside stimulus that pushes us out of homeostasis. Does that make sense? Uh, which is why the wilderness in the New Testament and the Old Testament is not necessarily evil. The wilderness is a place where you're out of homeostasis 
into something that's new, that's a little beyond your control. But the reason why the wilderness is, uh, is not evil is because out of the wilderness experience, something better can be produced. So that's why suffering can be, not always, but can be uh, something that is uh, maybe so bold as to say celebrated. Um, again, now, if you, have a, if you also have a gaze on the divine, uh, on the future horizon of divine glory, then you can take out all the big issues because death is not the final, 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 uh, you know, the final resting place, stopping place, whatever, um, because there's something greater even, even beyond that. Um, but out of suffering can produce virtue or maturation of faith. I actually like that term better. Virtue, I mean, I, you know, that's a little, we don't talk, we don't use virtue that much anymore or vices maybe. Uh, so, uh, but it can produce uh, a maturation of faith, things like patience, things like character, things like hope. Uh, I mean, those things, um, people who are knee deep in hope, uh, that is developed from being in experiences that, uh, that had suffering as a part of it. Or, or some level where they had to leave a homeo, homeostasis in, into, in, into maybe a wilderness or something else. Um, and uh, so from suffering can come virtue or maturation or growth, whatever you want to call it, which leads then to not just hope, divine future, but I would argue this is, this is the not yet part, all right, the hope. This is the now part, peace. You go through a, a time of, of suffering and what can take place. Now, it's not, um, it's not to just say everybody run to suffering, and, you know, but, but when suffering comes uh, or when pain comes into our life, um, you know, we, generally speaking, people will... You know, they, they want to do whatever they can to get rid of the pains, to go back to the, the place of homeostasis. But uh, that doesn't always equal into maturity or maturation of faith, virtue. But from suffering can come virtue, which then the effects of that is, uh, is a peace, can be a peaceful existence in the face of anxiety. All right, um, no show of hands, all right? Let me give you a good example. How many people in here have been divorced? All right, well, obviously y'all were not listening. I said no show of hands. So, I mean, uh, so, uh, all right, you know. Um, so, uh, but, so, for those that have, and if you haven't, then for those, I mean, you, you probably know somebody that has, so I want you to go back in your mind and replay the timeline, as painful as that might be, back to what it was that led up to the divorce, the divorce experience itself, and all the pain that's a part of that, and living out or living through that whole, that whole process into where you are today. All right, now there's a time component to that, and for some I would imagine it's a it's a, in this group, probably a longer period of time, which is not bad, right? So, but my point is, from something that was very painful, could lead, I would imagine that regardless of whose fault, so we're not getting into that, we're not going down that road, or, or the major cause or what have you, but out of that, there was change inside of you, the person, Right? Maybe learn some things about yourself, learn, learn some things about people, learn some things about relationships, uh, maybe form sense of character, uh, things of that nature. And coming through that process, at least now, if someone came up to you and said, I'm either about to be divorced or I am divorced and, and I'm, this is the end all be all for me, 
and, and life is over and I'm on my way to jump off the cliff. Okay? Right? So what would be your response? Well, that's the only way that it can be because there's no other existence other than that, right? Right. No, my, my point would be is from your personal experience, in the face of what can be, and I think this is a good analogy. I had a friend of mine that, that went through a divorce and said, what it feels like is someone just sliced off part of my body and I didn't get any pain meds. All right. So that's, that's the analogy. And uh, so out of that experience, um, at least when you approach that whole concept, it's different. Maybe even a little less anxious now than what it was before. Correct? Now, this I'm just throwing that out there. Is that my right? Yeah, I think I am. That's okay. I know I am, so it's all right. Yeah. Um, uh, I've watched this now for, you know, in my own family and inside of people's lives for a long time. So, uh, but that, that's just an example. There, there are other examples. Uh, people who go through surgeries and they, they go through the surgery, they have the surgery, they do the painful rehab, they come through the painful rehab, and then they have the existence that they have now. Though altered, it's different. And so then when someone else is about to face the very same thing, their approach to that is different. Right? Loss of loved one. All right, so we, we, we can have 10, we can go as many uh, examples if you, as you want it to be. Out of that can produce something inside the person which can lead to the now concept of the maturation of faith or the wholeness or salvation, at least when it comes to how we approach situations in life that want, us, that want to push us out of this, this state or place of homeostasis. Our approach to that is different because of our experience, which has now pain or suffering as a part of it. Now, the not yet part is that what we still put our eyes or our gaze on is that this right here, though bad as it would be, it does not compare to eternity. That's a harder scope for us to process because our life is, you know, Betty, you said 90, right? That, okay. You, you know, you have 90 years of experience. Um, probably got us all beat. Can anybody beat 90? All right, you're the winner, all right? So, uh, so Betty's the winner. You know, I, I don't know. We're working on it. Uh, we're, we're working on it, uh, but 90 years compared to eternity is still a blink. All right, so don't don't discount that. Now it's hard for us. I mean, we can only, we're conditioned to go by our experience. So you have to realize that God is outside of time and space, and so God's approach to to uh, eternity is is not limited by time. Um, so Paul is reminding uh, of his, his congregation, or, or these congregations, that there is a hope that, it, though harder to comprehend because our experience is, is so much uh, dictated by our time understanding, but there is something on the horizon, the future horizon, that is going to be restoration. Are you with me? So out of suffering can be something that leads to, uh, uh, to glorification, whether it be in the future component, when God puts all things right, uh, or at least in the now component to where we're moving towards the, um, uh, the nature of Christ and how Christ uh, interacts with life. Now that should be hopeful. Not easy. Hopeful. But Shane, I sure. Sure. Yeah, that's why it's that's why I didn't say it always is. All right? Because um, Sure. Right, all right, uh, or, or they die, 
All right, the good thing about that is they get to go to the front of the line. All right, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, seriously. All right, I, I'm not making light, but, but I'm, I'm, my point is there's two, si- there's two components to this. And, and don't discount what we just don't know. Could be. <laughs> well, there, there also is the part of the creation groaning, which means it's longing for something more. And, uh, and there, uh, because there are times where, uh, where these surgeries or, or what have you, uh, um, you know, what, what if the process stops here and not here? If you want to imagine a linear uh, component to this, um, keep in mind now he's also writing to people who are on who live here, not here. He's writing to believers, okay. And what he's writing is that not that it's always going to be happy, happy, joy, joy. What he's writing about is that, and this is be this would be my uh, uh, words. Don't discount the huge ace in the hole that you have in Christ Jesus. However it plays out. Whether it be now or something that you experience on this side, you know, of the ledger. Or if it's on this side of the ledger. If we really do believe that God is in the business of redemption, then then redemption is seen through the eyes of God, not ours, right? And that the purpose and the goal of redemption is going to reflect uh, God, who God is, and how God interacts with creation. But that's, I mean, I, you know, it's hard. I mean, the, the, you know, when the suffering is you or your family or something like this, I'm not saying it's easy, okay? I'm not trying to clean up suffering, all right? I'm not. I mean, I, um, you know, there are things that I, uh, that, I mean, I, I, I literally hate them. And they're, they're, I mean, diseases and, and things that exist uh, inside of just our life. I mean, I, I hate those things um, because they're so destructive. And, um, and, and they, because they have um, so much pain associated with it. And, and whether it be physical or, or emotional uh, or, or mental, um, I mean, for instance, abuse, you know, and particularly when that's with, and when that involves a child, okay? I mean, you know, it is, uh, it, it places the whole worldview of that child so far behind. Now, it doesn't mean that something good can eventually come to fruition, but, uh, I mean, I, I I don't, I don't have a lot of grace for people who abuse other people. Mentally, emotionally, sexually. Uh, I think it's an abuse of power. And uh, so my, my anger levels, I have to keep those in check whenever I see in, in whatever uh, situation where people are abusing another person. It's unfair. And, and it, it is, uh, and both parties are a fragile self, okay? They really are. And, um, but those things happen and there are testimonies of people who go through that and it ends poorly. And Paul's not yet writings would say it is horrible, no way to clean it up. The good news is that God's redemption is larger than just our experience of our life. And there really is a future restoration that is beyond us because we are not the author of salvation nor redemption. Remember we ended with this whole adoption last week? That's a gift. Children cannot adopt their parents. Adoption is an act of the parent to the child. 
And so there is something larger that even is beyond us. And thanks be to God. All right? Um, uh, but there are also testimonies where there are people who go through these horrible experiences and they, as painful as it is, okay, I'm not dismissing it. It's very painful going through this process. But they, they, they live here. What, what is it? Uh, Joni Erickson Tata, remember, you know? All right. Yeah. Dives off a lake. I mean, how many times have you, you know, up at your lake house or friend's lake house, you jumped in the water and break her neck? You know, I mean, that, that to me, uh, I take pride in my physical autonomy. I mean, to lose autonomy to me is a, another component that is uh, incredibly difficult. And, you know, I, I'm trying to prepare myself now, hopefully I'll live long enough, so that when that happens to me, you know, it's not game over. But to be able to approach even the concept of losing aspect of physical autonomy uh, with, with a sense of grace. Um, well, I don't think you wait until you, to that happens. You have to prepare yourself now. And uh, I mean, I'm preparing for retirement. I don't mean, I am preparing financially, hopefully. Uh, they say I'm doing okay. I, who knows? I don't, sometimes I think I'm not. Um, but, you know, of what happens when I'm not the person in control or in charge? Where are when people stop calling to seek my help or advice? That's a big deal. That's a huge deal for men. All right? So if you don't think so, you just haven't talked to a man in any, you know, you just, I'm serious. That's a huge deal. To losing the ability of levels of, of influence uh, is, uh, is it, it affects the psyche of a male. Now, I, I don't know what it's like for a female. I think I would imagine it's the same thing. Yeah, but I mean, for, for men who draw their sense of worth in our society, or at least a portion of their worth, from, from uh, functioning to not all of a sudden not function, uh, you know, or at least perceive themselves in a non-functioning road uh, can, can be very difficult. So, you know, at 46, I, part of my devotion is to remind myself that there will be a time that I will not be the senior minister. And hopefully I can, you know, not claw at that, you know, and, and, but to be able to approach it with a sense of, 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 Passing on from one to the next and, and get out of the way. And uh, so, you know, but I. Is any comfort at 90? I'm probably the thing I could best describe. Well, well, that's another thing, all right? So, uh, you know, uh, um, well, when, I'm, when my grandmother, when we finally had to take her car away, mm -hmm. uh, that, was a, that, was, that was a painful moment in the life of our family. And uh, when she had to move in with my mother, another, another aspect. So, uh, um, there, there are plenty of examples of, of what that's like. And, and the good news is that what just, again, just put into the pot to simmer, all right, is both this now and not yet aspect of life, life now that has a component of the Spirit that can guide us even through suffering that ends in two different ways or ends in one way but it, it along the way it has two two aspects of experience um yes no 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 yeah see this as a, the span of life okay life physically all right and uh and th there are um you know, y'all have heard me use the language of seasons, and, and I've, uh, uh, Teresa Edwards, who was uh, associate minister at um, Forest Hills, um, she, she probably, inside of our conference, is one of the most monastic individuals uh, that I know. And when I, when I moved to Macon, uh, to, to, was appointed to that church, she was on staff there, and um, her whole way of life is this seasonal understanding. And not like four seasons of winter, spring, you know. But the idea of just periods of life that 
are not defined by exact times. Um, but we just kind of live through these different seasons. She taught me that concept, and I'm so thankful for that. And uh, I'm just her, her style of life is contemplative. Her, I mean, and I'm not. I'm a, I'm a type A, you know, type person, and being able to stop uh, at that point in my life. And for, for instance, this is, give me, oh, I'm running out of time. All right, so uh, she, uh, we used to pray every Monday morning for the church. And, and John and I do that. I mean, it's not just something we did there. And we would go to this, this church had a prayer room. We'd go in the prayer room. And, uh, and I mean, I, I went in with a list. All right, come on, let's get it going. I got stuff to do. All right, this one, this one, this one. Let's, you know, we're going to pray for them. And uh, so we took turns leading. So when I was praying, I mean, it was just kind of like a laundry list. Boom, 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 boom. And then, then uh, come on, I got, I got stuff to do. And uh, whenever she would lead it, before we did anything, she started controlling, just slowing her breathing down. It used to drive me crazy. <laughs> and because uh, I could hear her just. Well, what I learned is that really is important. And so it just took me a while. And uh, cause I could really feel myself becoming less anxious just by controlling my breathing. And, uh, and then the, the way we approach praying was with some liturgy and some with not and, and just kind of going back and forth. And then we would finally get to people for intercessory prayer. And, you know, it, it would take forever. And, uh, you know, the first year, I mean, I, you know, that's why I don't have any hair back here, you know. And so, uh, <laughs> but what I learned is this, this concept to a different way of viewing time. And, and, and I mean, we, we live with this, okay? All right? Uh, but there's a, there's, a, there's a part to time that's incredibly biblical, kairos, which is seasonal, which is mountaintop to mountaintop, which is not defined by minutes or hours or days or years. It's, de it's, it's defined by experience, from one experience to the next. And, and God's timing, by the way, is seldom used in the Bible around chronological concept. God's timing is often referred to as kairos, which is more of that seasonal component, that from, from this experience to, to that experience. And if we just, again, put that in the pot to let it simmer, to to counteract the way we operate inside of our culture, which is heavy in pain-free, which is heavy in chronological understanding of time, which is heavy in functioning over being and, and, and things of that nature. And what the Spirit wants to do is not get rid of that stuff. It just wants to counter it with... Instead of living by what you do, your functioning, living by, by your being, who you are in Christ. Instead of it just being one event after another event after another event, event where it's just mindless consumption into embracing that even something that is painful can be used by the Spirit of God to lead to something that we do not have before this. And this is why Romans 8 is such a, a wonderful chapter is because it reminds us of, of the fullness of God's redemption. And that there, there is a now component that can even take something that is horrible and still work in the middle of that. And, you know, Joseph, Genesis, you meant this for evil. Somehow God has turned this into good. And it changed, I mean, and unbeknownst to all of them, what was going on, have no clue. And they did not have an accurate vision of those experiences until they're about three quarters of the way through. But when they look back, they see God not causing it, but they see God using it to bring about something that leads to redemption. I mean, and it is, it, 
It is one of the defining marks of Christianity and what we believe about who Jesus is and, and what Jesus does. And so just don't, we live again in these dichotomies where the, the pendulum swings from one to the next. When that happens, just, you know, put, take out of the pot the other side of it. All right? And that's what Paul is getting at in this text. All right? So uh, we're going to take a break. That's going to extend till next Tuesday. All right? So, uh, oh, yeah. Prayer list is uh, somewhere. Oh, it's up here. And uh, um, if, you're, if you want to, we could do, do it a couple of ways. You can wait around to make copies, or we can give it to Kathy and ask Kathy to email it out, whatever y'all, whatever. So, yes, you, sh- you can. Will do. All right, thank you. All right, uh, prayer list. There should be the, the refreshment list. Yeah, if, if whoever, whoever ends with the prayer list, if you would, give it to Kathy, and we'll have Kathy scan it and then email it out. And, uh, and then if you have the card for Louise, uh, if you haven't signed that and you want to, please do, and then make sure that it gets back to uh, Ann Walton. All right? Go in peace. I'll see you.